Morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. We have got some very exciting speakers today. And I'm Mark Collier with the OpenStack Foundation. And I am really excited about today's speakers because yesterday we heard from some of these titans of industry, Comcast, Best Buy, and Bloomberg. And people started to realize that OpenStack actually is mainstream now. We have mainstream users. And that's very exciting. It's a moment I think people have been wondering and waiting for for a while. And we finally arrived. But personally, I am still very excited by some of the interesting stuff going on outside of the mainstream, some trailblazers out there that are doing some really interesting things with OpenStack that are not about building businesses. They're about solving really huge massive problems and some of the smartest people in the world are working on. And the fact that OpenStack plays a part in that is just super exciting to me. It's not all about making money. There are people, one of whom we're going to hear from in just a moment, who is actually trying to unlock the secrets of the universe using OpenStack. That's a pretty big goal. Um, I personally hope that Randy can be the one that helps us figure out how to build a warp drive and get us out of the solar system. But, uh, you know, I got all my physics from Star Trek The Next Generation, so <laughs> I'm not sure if that's actually what he's working on, but I'd like to find out. So let's make sure we ask him that. Um, and another speaker that I am very excited to hear from who is unlocking all kinds of other secrets. Perhaps even some of y'all's, I don't know. But uh, I did put this disclaimer on here so that we don't all end up on a watch list. But if we do, we're all in this together, right? And so if you get, you know this was, OK. I don't know what this is, but it's definitely not a data center. Um, but we're going to be hearing from Nate from the NSA. And today's speakers, as I said, are far from the mainstream. And that's just fine by me. I think some of the greatest thinkers who've made the biggest breakthroughs uh, in history were a little different to a different drummer. Very, very smart people. And we have an actual spy, I think, who's trying to track all the things. And of course, an actual scientist who's trying to figure out the meaning of life in the universe and thoughts that are so big I, I can't even imagine. So, uh, we're going to be hearing from <laughs> Nathaniel Burton, who, you know, if that's his real name, I, I'm assuming it's legit. But uh, I am excited to welcome him up because he has a lot of courage. You don't hear a lot of people from the NSA coming forward and talking about what they're doing. But this is not a big surprise because I knew that Nate had a lot of courage when he actually built a OpenStack cloud on Cactus. So, you know, that was like, that was a big moment. So, you know, he, he'll tell you a lot more about that. But before we hear from Nate from the National Security Agency, we're going to hear from Randy Sobe, who's doing some really interesting cutting edge research. Hopefully, by the end of his presentation, we'll have a warp drive that's working. I don't know, but we'll see what happens. So, with that, I'd like to welcome up Randy. Thanks a lot. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm going to talk about clouds in high energy physics. I thought I would first maybe make a, uh, a definition or explain what high energy physics is. I'll leave the cloud definition to this group. I'd rather not put that one up. What we do as particle physicists or high energy physicists is study the fundamental particles of nature and their interactions. We use a variety of uh, facilities. Um, we use accelerators. The picture on the um, uh, far left is the uh, linear accelerator at, the, at Stanford University. I've been part of an experiment there for a number of years. The middle one is an underground, underground laboratory in uh, northern Ontario in Sudbury. It's 8,000 feet underground where we put detectors to look at particles from the sun. It's the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. I visited there. 
And then we have detectors in the uh, space station, the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Some of this was in the news in the last week. I'm hoping to go there, but I'm not optimistic. <laughs> With these facilities, we try to address a number of questions that are important uh, for our understanding of the universe. The, the one that you may have heard most about, and I'll explain a little bit more as I go along, is the, uh, the Higgs boson. You've, we've discovered this particle. I'm on one of the Atlas, the Atlas experiment at CERN, and we see evidence for the Higgs boson, which is supposed to be, give the source of uh, mass to all the particles that we know about. It's been coined the God particle. It's, that's not our name, but uh, it's sort of stuck in the media that way. And I'll, I'll go over a bit of the detail of this. We're also asking other questions. I mean, um, maybe you saw Angels and Demons about how we can make antimatter. We can, we can make antimatter, but one of the questions we're wondering is why the universe today is only made of matter and not matter and antimatter. We expect that the Big Bang, that we're both created equally, but why don't we see uh, a galaxy of antimatter and a galaxy of matter, but we don't. We only see matter. So something has happened during the evolution of the universe so that we only see matter in the world. And the other, the last question I'll just highlight, uh, uh, try again, is um, our understanding of the universe is actually pretty limited. This pie chart shows uh, that uh, atoms or matter is 5% of the universe, dark matter is 24%, and dark energy is 71%. And dark just means we don't know what it is. Uh, we find this out from projects such as this WMAP satellite that measures the temperature of the universe. We can also measure it uh, in, our, in uh, astronomical data and other. But the bottom line is we don't understand what 95% of the universe is made of, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so uh, we work, or at least I work at, uh, uh, in these projects, and so we have, uh, you know, astronomers use telescopes. Uh, in a sense of particle physics, and these accelerators are basically big microscopes. So we've evolved from these simple instruments to more complex instruments. The astronomers have their telescopes in space. Uh, we have uh, large detectors. This is the Atlas detector that I'm involved in during its construction at CERN. Our collaborations are now massive. The Atlas is 3,000 scientists. So the, these projects are, are uh, decades long, large, pro large scale projects. I work at the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. This is in Geneva. I think it's the largest instrument in the planet. It's 27 kilometers in diameter, or circumference rather, and it's 100 meters underground. And so protons circulate in this ring, one in one direction, one in the other, and we collide them in, in certain areas. It's basically a microscope, and we're probing distances of the order of 10 to the minus 20 meters. By going back in small distances, we're going back in time and studying the Big Bang. So it's sort of analogous to what the astronomers do. They look deep into space, and they go back in time. We look at small distances and go back in time. So in a sense, we're studying the same things in complementary ways. The Large Hadron Collider, as I say, is a tunnel. It's 27 kilometers. Um, you need a transportation to get around. The blue beam pipe, the blue pipes contain the magnets and two beam pipes for the protons to uh, circulate uh, opposite each other. It's also at 1.8 degrees Kelvin, so I think it's the biggest refrigerator in the world. At certain points along the ring, we have these detectors. So this is the Atlas detector. There is another large detector called CMS, and then there are other, two other specialized detectors as well. Uh, you can see the scale with the people at the bottom. It's 44 meters across, 25 meters high. Uh, it's basically a camera. Uh, I forget how many megapixels. So this is uh, the picture looking down the proton beam line in 2005 as the, de the, uh, the Atlas detector was being constructed. So in a sense, the center is hollow right now, and they're sliding the pieces in. So it gives you the scale of, of the facility. So it's a, a fairly large facility, and it took 
uh, probably f between five to 10 years to construct. Uh, today we're recording data. Uh, we've just finished a, a period of data taking and we're now in an upgrade period of two years where there's no more beam for that time. So this is a picture of a proton-proton event. The protons are coming in and out of the page. The yellow lines are the uh, charged particles. They bend one way or the other depending on their charge because there's a magnetic field. And the, the colored boxes around represent the energy of the. So we collect roughly um, 200 of these per second. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. Actually, I'll do it now. So the protons are colliding uh, every 25 nanoseconds. So we get 40 million per second. The Atlas detector then selects 100,000 per second, and then we pass them to event filter computers to uh, select 200 per second at two megabytes uh, per event. So we're collecting 400 megabytes uh, per second for roughly half the year. So this means we need a large computing system. Uh, what we've constructed over the last decade is called the WLCG uh, computing grid, worldwide uh, large hadron collider grid. And it's based on a hierarchical model where there's a large center at CERN, a tier zero we call it. There are 10 tier ones distributed around the world. The data from the detector comes to the tier one and then gets distributed to the 10 tier ones in near real time, a few hours. And then there are 60 other, uh, uh, what we call tier two sites uh, that are uh, distrib also distributed around the world for uh, creation of simulated data and analysis. At the moment, we're of the order of 140 petabytes of data. Uh, we have a, uh, a private routed network for most of these facilities, all at 10 or 100 gig now. Now, in last year, we uh, found evidence for the Higgs, both Atlas and the CMS experiments, uh, see evidence for a Higgs-like particle. Um, uh, the little circular picture is the same one where I'm sort of cutting the view along the direction of the proton, and the other picture on the left is more of a three-dimensional one. It's where the candidate particle goes to two, four electron-like particles. It's either an electron or a muon. The muon is just a heavier version of an electron. If we, here's the only science plot you'll get. Uh, this is a, a frequency plot. So I'm uh, plotting the mass of those four leptons as a function of, uh, uh, as a function of its mass. So the number of candidates is in the vertical axis, the mass is on the bottom. And we see an excess of events at about 125 proton masses. Uh, the colored, uh, the points are data and the, the other histograms or the colored plots are the uh, predictions of our simulation. And our, uh, the, we would get the red, uh, the red and the purple would, is based on no Higgs and the, little, the blue box is uh, what we expect for the, for the Higgs particle. So we see it in this channel, we see it in other channels, and we see it in two experiments. So I think we're, we're pretty confident that it is. And as a result, this made the mainstream media, uh, I think, last summer. So uh, it was all across uh, 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 the world in this way. Okay, so I'm gonna change direction just for the last part of my talk. Uh, how are we using clouds in high energy physics? Uh, one of our first uses was to help us preserve uh, and archive high energy physics data so that we can continue to use it in the future. We're trying to use clouds to take advantage of special com uh, computing resources that I sort of also described that are attached to our detectors. Uh, a more common use is to help us simplify just the management of in-house resources. Uh, we've used commercial clouds to some extent for exceptional needs. And one of the projects that I'm interested in and some of my group and colleagues are working on is how can we uh, use a if you want a grid of clouds where we can utilize both high energy physics, non high energy physics resources to meet some of our computing needs. So uh, I mentioned the, uh, the Slack accelerator before. There was a, uh, uh, a detector experiment there called BABAR. It studied B quarks, B and a B bar, so that's why it's BABAR. And we got to use BABAR uh, as long as we don't change the color or change the shape of the elephant. Um, 
you see an event picture. It's a, it's a, lower, excel, a lower energy accelerator, so you see uh, simpler pictures of events. It's again along the direction of the beam line. And this ex uh, experiment stopped taking data in 2008. Uh, the problem we face is there's, you know, once an experiment ends, the funding stops, but we still want to analyze data. We still have graduate students looking at some of this data. And we may want to look at it in five years. But we have nobody maintaining the system. The software will not be maintained beyond a Scientific Linux 5, a Red Hat 5 operating system. Uh, and so we need to maintain the, 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 the software. The software will only run on an old operating system. And so we have to build a, uh, what we call a long-term data access system. So it's the first experiment that's done this. It did it a few years ago. Uh, it's basically a static cloud. They just build the you know, SL5 VMs, it just has access to the software and the data and it's, it's transparent to the users and it's been in operation for a while. As I mentioned with the Atlas trigger, we have these racks of processors that are used in real time to filter the data. But now we're down for two years. So we're converting these, what we call HLT farms, high level trigger uh, cloud, to clouds. Uh, so we, you know, we don't need these 50,000 cores. They'd sit idle if we didn't use them. So they're being converted to OpenStack clouds. I think there, some of them are in operation today and there's actually a talk today by Tony Perez at 11. So I encourage you to go see it. I won't say any more. We're also using uh, uh, or converting our, our, our internal resources to clouds, either that they're transparent to the, to the users or they appear as cloud resources. The IBEX cloud, uh, uh, Jan van Eldek and Tim Bell are, are in the audience, and you can find out more about them. But you know, that's one example of how we're starting to convert our facilities uh, uh, into, com uh, 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 not commercial, but uh, uh, cloud-based uh, 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 platforms. We've also used uh, commercial resources in a, I'd say, a limited way with Amazon, Google, Rackspace, others. Um, uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, uh, reports by the, there's a STAR experiment at Brookhaven, there's the Bell experiment in Japan, and Atlas and others have used it. Typically, it's been used uh, for exceptional demands where we don't have enough capacity to get enough data or pr process for a particular conference. And we tend to use it for uh, uh, low I.O. demands, say, generating simulated data. It, we've, it, we face challenges using it. Um, you know, particle physicists use X509 certificates uh, for identity management, so we have to figure out different ways to do it. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, v network connectivity, for example, if I want to get to Amazon from Canada, I have to go over to Commodity Network, which is a pain. And the costs are a little bit higher than our private resources. So we're using it, we're using it but as I say, uh, for exceptional resources or exceptional needs. The area where I have a bit of interest in is uh, trying to uh, take advantage of our distributed uh, computing infrastructure. Because particle physics is a, colla uh, a world, you know, global collaboration, everyone has their resources and we would like to use them in some kind of seamless way. We've tried, well, we've, we have built a grid, it's working, but I think uh, one of the ideas maybe is to try to use it as a grid of clouds. Uh, it's also been coined as sky computing by Kate Kehi of Chicago. So what we're trying to do is uh, use both dedicated and non-dedicated high energy physics resources, uh, uh, you know, we want to use them independent of the cloud type. We want to remove any application dependence from the actual site, but also support multiple projects, as I'll show you in a minute. I just want to show you uh, a very simple workflow for what we're doing, and then you can see how uh, uh, you know, some of my requests, maybe for OpenStack development, would be useful. So we have a system where a user submits a batch job to uh, HT Condor. Uh, we have these clouds out there, but we have a, a, a customized service, what we, sh we call Cloud Scheduler. Uh, so this Cloud Scheduler, the user submits a job, the Cloud Scheduler discovers the job, the Cloud Scheduler then boots a virtual machine on one of the clouds. That VM registers itself with Condor, 
and then the, the job gets dispatched to that VM. So that's how we're running a, a cloud of, uh, I think, 10 or 12 uh, uh, distributed clouds right now. We use a combination of Nimbus clouds, OpenStack clouds, we can, and uh, some commercial clouds. Uh, the VM, for some of them, are pulled in from a remote repository. The data is also remote as well. For OpenStack clouds, we upload it. So we're using it for Atlas in production. We're also using it in the Canadian astro uh, astronomical uh, community. They use it for user analysis. Uh, we have a variety of clouds. Um, we've had ties with the Nimbus group for a number of years, but uh, and that's pr proved to be a fruitful collaboration. So we have clouds uh, that we have used uh, in uh, Victoria, Ottawa, Excuse me, uh, and Future Grid at Chicago, Future Grid San Diego, and we've uh, also in Florida. In terms of OpenStack, we've used Melbourne Nectar clouds, the CERN Ibex cloud. Uh, there's two Canary clouds that we brought online last week, and we're starting to talk with the Oxford people. Um, so we've run, we've been in operation for about a year and a half. Uh, Astronomy has run maybe 500,000. We're over 300,000 jobs now using 10 clouds. Uh, now, yesterday, we were running a thousand simultaneous jobs. So, I mean, it's not large, but it's, it, we're just starting to get going now. And their jobs are r roughly 12 hours, and they run, and they're all submitted, at least the Atlas jobs are submitted from CERN. Uh, we can, in principle, use Amazon and, and Google as well. So, th this just shows uh, this week. Uh, these are uh, uh, just the number of uh, uh, each. Uh, it's the number of uh, virtual machines that we boot up as a function of the day of the week. Each color is a different cloud. Uh, some clouds go up and down depending on their internal needs, but generally we're running about 100, 100 to 150 whole node VMs, so uh, as the order of 1,000 jobs. And uh, uh, the, as I say, we uh, list nine clouds there and the, over three continents. So it, it seems to work uh, reasonably well. Um, and we're hoping to scale it up further. So, uh, as a, I guess I'm a particle physicist that's interested in computing. Um, I, at least I see myself and my team as integrators rather than developers of cloud technology. And what we would like to see uh, that would help our life is uh, the following, uh, at least these uh, key things, is common authentication. Uh, you know, um, maybe a centralized VM image store that we could uh, download from rather than having to upload to every uh, cloud. Uh, maybe consistent metadata and uh, don't use Nova as your cloud name. <laughs> so um, there's some things you could help uh, simplify us, uh, simplify our lives for us. Okay, so I'm, I'm reaching the end. So I just want to summarize the goal of high energy physics is to understand the universe. Uh, we've, we believe we've discovered the Higgs. The next step in the LHC is uh, to search for the, can the particle that's the source of dark matter. Maybe we'll understand the difference between uh, matter and antimatter with our studies. We do have an impact on society. Uh, it's always useful to remind you that the World Wide Web was developed by particle physicists at CERN. The first two sites were CERN and SLAC. There are now more accelerators in hospitals for uh, imaging uh, and uh, cancer treatment. Um, uh, you know, building these large instruments uh, generates technology development. I mean, just look at the cryogenics involved with the LHC, and we're training uh, highly qualified people. In terms of computing, we have large distributed uh, systems. Um, uh, initially grid, now we're looking more towards cloud. We have a, a, a very uh, a big global network that consumes a lot of the bandwidth. And we're trying to use the novel uh, computing technologies that this community uh, is, is developing uh, for. So that's all I have to say. Uh, clouds are, are a collaborative uh, uh, endeavor. And uh, many people have helped us in our work. And uh, I need to acknowledge them. If you want uh, to contact me, this is my email. I'm around for for today, and our, that's our website. So, thank you. Thank you.